everyone, this is Chris Grasso with the Indie Spirituals Podcast on the Be Here Now Network. And my guest today is none other than, none other than the one and only Mr. Dan Cortez. Dan, thank you so much for joining me. Chris, thank you so much for having me, bud. Good to be here. Yeah, it's a, the pleasure's mine. Before we dive into what I'm sure is going to be a really fun and engaging conversation, just want to read your bio for our listeners and sure. give a little background. I'm sure they know some about you, but here's a little more. Dan Cortez shot to stardom as the creator and host of the Emmy award-winning MTV Sports, where he interviewed everyone and everything that had to do with the world of sports and entertainment for six successful years. Cortez's numerous television credits also include memorable guest-starring roles on Seinfeld. He was Elaine's mimbo boyfriend that George had a man crush on, Melrose Place for a season as the evil Jess Hansen, Andy Richter controls the universe, The Single Guy, and Hot in Cleveland with Betty White. Cortez has appeared in many feature films, including Demolition Man, opposite Sylvester Stallone and Sandra Bullock, and After Sex with Brooke Shields. A native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Dan attended the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he played football for the Tar Heels, and he currently resides in Los Angeles. And I tripped over some of my words there, but I think that people get the point, Dan, again. Thank you so much. Thank you for being that. That was very nice. Well done. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm going to try and live up to that. Here we go. <laughs> I don't think you're going to have a problem. So, all right. You have this incredible new book out, Step Off, My Journey from Mimbo to Manhood. Really great book. Um, just came out, what, on this past Monday, right, I believe? Uh, yeah, Tuesday, yeah. Tuesday, Tuesday. okay. Um, absolutely love it. And you've been posting, we were just talking about how you often use the hashtag, it's not what you think, and I couldn't um, agree more, and we're going to get into that, but I've got to get one thing out of the way. Sure. we got to start with Seinfeld, and sure. I know you've talked about this a million times, but that episode, first of all, Seinfeld and Curb, are, they're like my favorite shows of all time. That episode is easily top 10, probably top five for Seinfeld, which is no small feat. You know, that's, there. how many great episodes? Right, so many. And it's your character. I mean, the can't spare a square, that's funny and everything, but you made that episode, the memo, the, you know, <laughs> step off. So what I want to ask you, and I did see an interview where you talked a little bit about, and I would, thought this was great, the night before you were working with uh, Jason Alexander and he turned his hat around and asked, yeah. you know, do you think it'll be funny? And, and you said, yeah, and then Larry David's like, no, and he did anyways, no. and it was amazing. Yeah. So if, if you could... Tell me a little bit uh, maybe about that experience or anything else about shooting on Seinfeld that total Seinfeld nerds like myself will sure. totally eat up that you, you want to share. Well, uh, the um, just as you can tell from the title of the book, right, that it plays a large part uh, just in the backstory of my story. But just starting within the Seinfeld, I, I got a call um, on a Monday from my manager saying that Larry and Jerry wanted to meet with me. Yeah. And um, and at the time, I, I had never done a, um, a sitcom, an episode yeah. of a sitcom. I had done dramas, but never done an episode of a sitcom. sitcom. And Seinfeld was my favorite show on TV, yeah. like so many people. Right. So I was like, of course, what am I gonna do? And the way that call sort of played out was like, I assumed and he assumed it was an audition. So I was gonna go audition. Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld. Okay, great. Nerves, of course. <laughs> right. But it was later in the afternoon. I think it was around four or five o'clock at night. And I go. They shot it at CBS Radford out in the Valley, here in L.A. And um, went out there. And the only two people in the room were Larry and Jerry. When I got there, so the assistant's like, "Yeah, let me bring you in." And they're just relaxed, chilling out on the couch. How's it going? How you doing? And we sat there and just talked. Just so like no ego. From them, which I think is important wow. for so many people to know, Seinfeld fans. Yeah. Uh, but they, we just talked about matter of fact stuff, almost just like the show, where it's, yeah. how you doing? What's going on? What's the traffic? I don't know. What are kind of cards? It's, and so then I said at one point, I'm like, do you have sides or a scene that you guys want me to do for you? And, and Larry just goes, no, no, we're good. <laughs> we just needed to see if you could put two words together, is all he said. Wow. And so, you know, I kind of laugh and I said, okay, and not really sure what was going to transpire from then. He's like, so uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. And 
tomorrow was the first day working on the show for the week. So I apparently got the job. He said, we just wanted to see if you could put two words together. Okay, great. But they had said, you know, we wrote this character basically with you in mind. And looking back at that, I go, was that a compliment? <laughs> um, but even getting there the following day, which was table read, is basically how a traditional sitcom reads right. uh, works. Is for the week you do a table read, which is everybody sits around a table with all the writers, and you read the script out loud. The writers go, "This joke works. This joke doesn't work." Okay, we're going to send all the actors home. All the writers go back and fix whatever. But getting back to the ego thing, everybody from you know the director. The cast, no ego. It was just, and I've worked, trust me, I've worked on shows and with actors where they're successful shows, but you just go to work on like, oh man, okay, I gotta mm. go in here. Because you know you're gonna deal with just some stuff that is unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, where, especially on sitcoms where you're like, we're supposed to be having fun and this stuff right. is funny. You want that to come across. So I think that's a huge reason, other than the fact that those people were so extremely talented, yeah. uh, but that's a huge reason in the success of that show as well. And also they just loved the creative process. If you had an idea, you wanna try something, what is it? Larry was always looking for, if, if it's funnier than what we got, let's do it. And um, the whole thing about Step Off, how that <laughs> came about was I can't remember the scripted line for yeah. what character was supposed to say. and But it just, Larry, the, the writers felt it wasn't working. Right. So Larry's just, they came up with a few, he's like, I don't know, I don't think they're funny. And then he asked me, he's like, you know, you're 23. You work on MTV, what do kids your age say? If you're telling somebody to get the hell out of here, whatever. So it was like the second or third thing I said was step off. And I couldn't even <laughs> tell you what the other things, uh, examples I gave. And then Jason just said it like, step off, and, and his <laughs> accent and, and the crew laughed and Larry goes, use that, say that. So I've been, I've heard that where I've been given credit, we're like, Dan, improv the line. And just, and I was like, hey, I want to set the record straight. I didn't, trust me, I was not going to improv anything on Seinfeld. So I just gave him, <laughs> that was an option. But then they said it. And I saw uh, Jeff Garland at a, a, um, a charity event yeah. years ago where he had said, hey, I talked to Larry and Larry said, you that was your line. You came up and I told him the same thing. I'm like, no, I was. I wish I could take credit for that. That was just an option that I gave them. But, um, And that's how they worked. I don't know if you ever heard the story about the, the episode. And again, then I'll stop with the Seinfeld. But for sure. Seinfeld enthusiasts, uh, yes. the episode where Jerry can't remember the girl's name. He just remembers his girlfriend's name rhymes with Mulva. a female body part. <laughs> And that and Mulva came from they all the the lines they had on show night weren't working, weren't working, weren't getting a laugh. So the writers are sitting down in between scenes trying to rewrite furiously in front of the audience. And the warm up guy is trying to keep the audience engaged and says, hey, who does anybody have an idea for the writers? And some guy raised his hand and said, what about Mulva? And apparently the crowd loses their minds, laughs and Larry goes, stop writing we're using Mulva, and I laugh because I tell my wife, okay, you know there's some guy like in Milwaukee sitting in a bar telling people, you know, I went to an episode of Seinfeld, and that was this episode, and they couldn't come up, and I gave them that. And, they, and I'm sure all his friends are like, yeah, no, no, it's not you. But <laughs> that's just, you know, it's, it's credit to them showing the whole creative process where at the end yeah. of the day, they just want funny, as funny yeah. as could be. <clears throat> I yeah. mean, this conversation is about you, but just quickly about the creative. I, I did see the, the marine biologist episode. Um, I don't remember the context of that final scene, which is probably top three scenes for me in Seinfeld, where George gives a speech about, um, you know, the, the sea was angry that day, my friends, like a <laughs> old man trying to re return soup at a deli. That yeah. was written the night before. I don't remember if it was Larry or Jerry who wrote it. And I remember they gave it to Jason like, we only have one take to do this tomorrow. It was and it was a solid monologue. Yeah. He memorized it and nailed it in one take. And it's just yeah. you know, the brilliance of those people. And hey, you vouched for the hat turning backward, whereas Larry said no. So that is hilarious that, too. And you know what? That again was also that was show night in front of the crowd. Yeah. And that was in between takes. And then that's when Jason because Jason had on like a brown check. Yeah. 
hunting cap. It wasn't even a baseball hat. Yeah. Really. And he just said, what if I do this? Is that fun? And he did it. And you saw like the bald spot through the, the back of the hat. And so I funny. laughed. I said, I think it's Larry. So he called Larry up and said, what do you think? And Larry just says, no, don't do it. It's not funny. Uh -huh. And he did it anyway. And that they had to cut. They had to edit the laugh out of that because it went on for so, so long. long. And he just sat there and milked it and milked it. So, uh, and again, Larry had a nice uh, expletive for him after he did that, yeah. just kind of, yeah. But, uh, you know, just such an amazing experience. And, and yeah. what a way to be baptized into the world of sitcoms. Seriously. Yeah. Right before we got on the call, my fiance is working from home with COVID. She's in the other room. And uh, we both were going to say, ask each other something. We yelled simultaneously, total accident. Hey, babe just like and we both start cracking up i'm like yeah i'm supposed to, to talk to dan in a few minutes so thank you man. that's great lines all right so let's move on from seinfeld because this book is so great and i want to unpack as much of it as we can for listeners okay. so sure. right off the bat um let's see here let me there's some lines and quotes from it and i want to uh, you know explore that with you <clears throat> um let me see where we're going to start here um, oh, right in the beginning, I was you had me right in your introduction. You talk about and paraphrasing here, but you talk about Googling yourself a while back and how all these images came up of you as Tony, the character we were just talking about or sure. the Melrose Place thing. And um, I wonder if I had a quote here from that. I think you. What was it? Um, when I'm what, what I, I'm sorry, while I am truly proud of all these moments in my life, they more or less define what I've done not who I am. So mm -hmm. first of all, that lovely. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience taught you and, and who, sure. are, who, who are you? Who is Dan Cortez? Well, that's sort of the, that's what the book is about. It is, yeah. my, and it's my journey trying to figure that out yeah. and uh, getting back to Seinfeld a little bit, which will yeah. take me to answer your question. When I was approached by the publishers to write the book, um, they kept saying, they saw I had a new baby. We have a one and a half year old. And he said, you know, I just, this guy who I'd never met in person and had been friends for about six, seven years. And I had maybe spoken to him on the phone three times in my life, mm -hmm. emailed a few times. And he was adamant about, I want you to write something positive. You're such a positive guy, but about fame and fatherhood, fame and fatherhood. So, but he kept saying, I wanted to be Dan. I wanted to be more Dan, more Dan. And I said, you know, I gotta be honest. I don't, I've never met you in person. You keep saying more Dan. I don't want to sound like a jerk. I don't know what you mean by that. Right. And I said, we've never met in person. Just tell me, what do you think I'd be like if we met in person? What type of guy? And then he said, well, he had basically talked to people around the office. And he said, we all sort of came up to the conclusion that you'd be a lot like that character you played on Seinfeld. And he went on to just say very nice things and compliment me for the next minute. All I heard was you're a mimbo. Yeah. You're, you're, and in my mind, I was that clicked and I was like, I'll write the book. I want to write the book because in my mind, I wanted people to know that I, I'm more than that. Absolutely. And, and that's why there's a quote from the book too, where I said, if you don't like the narrative of your story, become the narrator. Yes. So uh, to answer your question, he had then reached out to John Gordon, who's a, uh, author, well-known speaker, positivity yeah. guru, and he introduced me to John via an email. And he said, John, if the, at the end of that email, all these very nice things about me, and then John, if you want to know more about Dan, just Google him. So when I read that, I was just like, okay, so I'm, I want to see what John's going to see. So you do that, and it's like, wait a second. this That's not me. So again, that really... Uh, was sort of the icing on the cake for me. It's like, yeah. now I definitely have to do this. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of my um, launch point to, to write the book. And then I went from there saying, okay, if I want to do this right, um, I, you know, I looked at my life like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm. And, I, and, and looking at it, I'm like, okay, this is who I think I am. But now let's just take it all apart and let's start taking these little stories in my life. And I think I even wrote in the book, not necessarily the quote unquote important stories, right. but the ones that for some reason you remember them. You don't know why you have this memory from yeah. the age of 10, but you remember it for some reason. I wanted to take those moments and sort of piece it all back together and figure out if I was who I thought I was. I said, and, and I think it's in the introduction as well, where I said, look, everybody is the same. How you view yourself, how others view you and how you think others view you are three entirely different things. Absolutely. So 
you know, I think it, it any time or at some point in all of our lives, we should just kind of break it all down a little bit and put that puzzle back together just so we know who we really are, who we truly are. I love that. It's something that I feel grateful that I learned a little bit earlier in my life, whereas some people don't learn it till later, if at all. And it's reevaluating the paradigms, you know, not, and not even yeah. just about ourselves, about life. Like we've hold on, held on to these beliefs, you know, about ourselves, about the way we view the world. And they go for so long without being revisited. And is that still serving me? Is that outdated? And I love that that's what you did in your book, you know, and, and you're encouraging others. And and you even right. give little blueprints, which we'll talk about or little, you know, you have your little list that you included that I absolutely love. And, and I'll share those as we go on. Yeah, yeah. So um, you go on, you also poignantly, very poignantly, right? And this is a little bit longer of an excerpt, not long, but um, sure. I, I I was going to paraphrase. I'm like, no, this is beautiful. As life rapidly passes us by, too often we take the tiny pieces, those little moments, and discard them to the side as if they were irrelevant and unnecessary. This book is a chance for me to do something that all of us should do at some point in our journeys. Sit down with an open, on, with open, honest eyes and lay out all the puzzle pieces of our life on the table. Once you've put them back together, does that finished puzzle look like what you thought it would or does it look entirely different? Just like any of us who have uh, lives a full life, that's what I'm anxious to find out. So I know that's what we just discussed, but still right. wanted to share that because you know we're talking about. But that's just that's the that's a big part of this book, you know, right? It, the, the humility with which you write and the lightheartedness as well. And and you know, Thank as you. we were saying earlier, you poke fun and don't take things too seriously. And there are serious things, but it's it's a really great job. Thank you. And, I I wanted to. Um... I wanted my personality also to come across yeah. um, in the book as well and my sense of humor and uh, b because as important as it was for me to sort of figure out and dig deep for who I am, I was also trying to let people know who I am. Right. And, um, you know, it was just really um, a cathartic experience. And that's why we had talked off camera a little bit prior to going on camera where I said, you know, it's not your traditional it, because it was very important for the publishers that I have because it's broken down into three sections, foundation, right. fame and fatherhood. And in their minds, it was you had to write about the fame. Let's hear of about that. Everybody wants to hear right. stories about, you know, working with Kirstie Alley and working. And, you know, I didn't want it to be that traditional sort of I don't know. I really had fun on this episode when I did <laughs> because that in my mind wasn't what the book was. So. Even in that section, I tried to choose stories that I really learned something from or right. took something from um, and stories that people didn't know as opposed yeah. to, oh, he did this and did that. So um, that, ironically enough, was the most difficult part, part. <laughs> you know, working, having worked as an actor for um, almost 30 years now, that was the most difficult part for, for me to write. And I had so yeah. many friends that were like. What are you writing in there? What are you oh. uh, like actor friends that are you, you're not going to I'm like, don't worry. Like, no, nobody's getting thrown under the bus. It's right. not that kind. Well, I got to say, when I saw our mutual friend, Jonas Elrod, who wrote a really nice endorsement amongst you know some other great people for it. Um, you know, I've known Jonas for many years and, and we're kind of these, quote unquote, we're seen as like spiritual, you know, rebels, right. whatever. Yeah, I call it what you will. I don't like being categorized, period. But Jonas is the real deal. And that's why we really connect. And when I saw him post your book, I didn't know that you had a book coming out. And, you know, of course, know who Dan Cortez is. But when I saw Jonas, I'm like, what the hell? Honestly, like, because <laughs> I'm like, huh? That's good. That's yes, good. it was. And, and so right away, I'm like, all right, so there's got to be something here. And I messaged him and I'm like, what's up with the book, man? Like, and he's like, dude, you love it. Cause you know, he knows me, I know him. And he's like, there's a lot of spirituality in there, but it's not, you know, purposefully spiritual. And he's not telling you what you have to do, which is something you specifically write about. And we'll talk about yeah. later, but yeah, man. So love it. And thank you. Thank you. while we're talking about spirituality quickly, um, I did want to also ask you about still early in the book, you're talking about what you call quote unquote, an enlightening premonition that you experienced. Yeah with your mom and it was really beautifully written you know you, you you said it was like something in the universe was speaking to you and not to get woo woo yeah. or airy fairy but you knew right. something beyond you was happening i'd love to hear you talk about yeah, yeah right yeah. i actually i have them two talking that's the power of yeah. life right so yeah. yeah can you talk a little about a little about that 
That was, um, and I've never had another feeling like that. But that yeah. was my, my sister at the time lived in Ohio. I grew up out uh, about twenty minutes west of downtown Pittsburgh, which is. You know, we were about an hour, an hour 15 away from the Ohio border, and my sister lived just across the border in Ohio. We had gone to visit her, and we were on our way home. We were getting on the on-ramp of the Ohio Turnpike, and this, you know, it's so, you know, it's so hard to sort of describe with words when yes. this sensation of warmth and calm, yeah, uh, uh, but just um, comes came over me, and I was young. I was yeah. like 12. Yeah. Um, and you just get this feeling of everything's going to be okay. But I also got, it was as if I said the universe was speaking to me. I always wanted to be in the entertainment industry and be an actor yeah. and host. Oh, and it was sort of this, uh, I don't want to say vibe, but this sensation yeah, yeah. of you're, don't worry. That's what you're going to do. I've yeah. got you. Yeah. And people, I've spoken to people where they're like, did you think it was God? And I go, I don't know who, I don't right. know if it was God. I said, maybe it was my angels. Maybe it was just somebody saying, we've got you. Yeah. And, you know, as a young boy, even now, as you can tell, I don't stop talking. My mom had <laughs> asked me in the car that day, she was just like, are you okay? Like, you get real quiet. So I told her. And we yeah. were the only two in the car. So I told her what had happened. And, you know, like, I say in the book, I said, any good mom? She's like, that's, oh, that's great, sweetie. Of course, you're going to do whatever you want to do. Yeah. yeah, that's, but, you know, I talk to her now. She's just turned uh, 85. Cool. And she said, I remember, she still remembers it, though. Wow. She goes, I remember you telling me that. And, um, you know, it, it, as I went through life and got older, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, I always felt that I had that safety net there. Yeah. Uh, that's already happened once that can happen to me again. I can, yeah. you know, and, and, um, the older I've gotten, I've tried to become more spiritual and, and open and aware and living in the moment. And yeah. that's something I talk about in the book too, where, yeah. um, you know, it's just the, you, you can't recreate those moments, but you just try and live for those moments. Right. And there's something beautiful found in that too. Yeah, I think it's awesome. And like I said, that's what I love is reading this. You know, to me, there were many spiritual lessons to take away from this book. People might not, sit, you know, look at it traditionally, quote unquote, spiritual. And I don't think you would necessarily call it that. But that's, you know, that's the experience I had with a lot of it. Thank you. Look, even even in uh, writing that chapter, I wanted that to be in there. Yeah. I didn't know how to put it in there. Yeah. And I was also and you can probably tell just from the way I worded it, I was also concerned with the fact that I, I wanted to be honest with the reader, but I also didn't want people to go like, Oh God. Okay. Right. Right. Here we go. Oh, he knew when, you know, he was a young boy. He knew. <laughs> yeah. Cause it wasn't that type of moment. Right. Um, right. It yeah. was just, it was an enlightening moment in my For life. Sure. Um, and I wanted to share it. But again, with words, you, it's sort of having never written a book before. Anyway, I didn't know how to, how do I take that moment and put it into yes. words and then put it on the page? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've sat at a keyboard <laughs> for a few of my books for days, you know, and just how that's, you can say it better. How? Cause you can, it's, it's an ex experience. that's almost a non-experience in a way. It's such a perfect exactly. feeling. It's so I understand. I think our audience and many listeners totally get where you're going with that. And that's what I love too, is that, you know, you, you did take some risks in this book in the sense that, you know, yeah, you, you put the stories in of the fame and, and the wonderful experience. It's nothing to take away from that, but you are also putting yourself out there with these, you know, like that is a perfect yeah. example, you know, but you do it in such a way where, yes, it's not preachy. It's not like overly esoteric or woo. -woo. It's just, Hey, this happened. It was real. And it stuck with me ever since. And I, I applaud you for doing that. It's really cool. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. So, yeah. So moving on, um, sure. another, um, this is something I really loved. It, I, a lot of these, I got to get my on the clock because I want to get through as much as I can. Do it. Um, <laughs> you write, this was a really cool experience you had that set you up for later in life. And you revisit this experience at one point later in the book. You're talking okay. about it was your senior year um, at UNC. You're working at a steel mill in Pittsburgh, I believe, was it? Yeah, outside of Pittsburgh, yeah. Wampum, it's, Pennsylvania. Right. And so you talk about what you call a sim seemingly simple, unassuming moment. But one that, in the end, actually had this incredibly pivotal moment in your life. So, yeah. you know, I don't want to give all your book away here, but 
that you know you go on to talk a little bit about the seemingly simple moment that otherwise could have just you know you could have just brushed it off had this yeah. incredible impact so i and and you do talk about how that happens for other people it happens for all of us and if we're yeah. lucky like you were something grabs us and and we yeah. learn from it so yeah can you talk a little bit about that and how sure. it became such a big moment for you Sure. I had, um, I was working, I got a job working during the summer before yeah. my senior year at Carolina, uh, working in a steel mill and it was a smaller mill and it was about, it was close to the Ohio border. Like I said, it was in a little town called Wampum, Pennsylvania and it's a small little town and the majority, 99% of the people in that town worked at this mill. Right. And because I wasn't union, uh, people didn't really care for me. I was a college student, the guys that worked there. So I got the worst job possible. Every night you'd go to the, the job board and you'd little dry erase board, see what you, so since I wasn't union, I was called the utility guy, which yeah. meant I got <laughs> the, the worst job. So, um, but I was working graveyard shift and I'd work, yeah. that was the only way they'd hire me. I was working midnight to eight and sometimes midnight to noon. And um, cutting to the chase, there was uh, about a month into it, a few guys befriended me. So when I'd have, you know, your meal break, or your lunch at 4 a.m., you'd sit down and they'd let me eat with them. Yeah. Uh, and it was one night, and I think I even say in the book, it was very, had a very Shawshank Redemption vibe. Yes, you did. Vibe to right. It because it was pouring outside. We were on our meal break, and it was pouring down rain. And where we would go to eat had a metal roof. So you could hear it. And it was everybody was quiet other than the rain. Right. And one guy you know, we're eating, just started to talk about how he had gotten a pool for his kids. But the story wasn't really about the guy getting a pool for his kids. The story became, and he wasn't addressing anyone. He was looking down and eating, but the story became how his kids don't know him. He's worked the graveyard shift for so long that they don't know him as dad. They know him as the guy that got him a pool because when he comes home from work, they wake up, he goes to sleep. He gets up, he eats, they're eating, then he leaves to go back to work. So he went into this very deep, you know, um, I wanna say he exposed himself to us as far as saying, hey, this is what my life is. I don't know my kids, you know, yeah. and he shared that to yeah. us. And um, it was, you know, from a guy that you'd look at and just see on the street and be like, oh man, he kick anybody's butt that he walks right. by. He was being very honest and open with us. And so I sort of took that moment. Then when he was finished, to, I started talking about how I was considering not going or finishing school that year because the reality of me just thinking like, I want to be an actor. Yeah, I'm telling everybody, I'm going to be an actor. I've got this. This is what I'm going to do. But then I didn't know a soul in Los Angeles. I didn't know anybody in the entertainment industry. I didn't have anywhere to live out here. I really didn't have any money. And then I started thinking, what am I going to do if I'm an actor? How am I going to come back to Pittsburgh yeah. and be a successful actor? How am I going to make ends meet? All these things. So I had considered, like, do I just stop? Do I start working now? And no, is college really that important? Does that right. piece of paper really mean? And I shared that with them, and I hadn't told it to anybody else at that point. And these guys just staring holes through me for about three to five seconds, just looking at me. And the guy that told the story about his, you know, uh, getting the pool for his kids just said, hey, you know, it's your life, we're not gonna tell you what to do, but the one thing I will say is you've been given an opportunity. And hold on, let me see, something just happened. Are we still, okay, there we go. Yeah, he said, yeah. um, uh, you've been given an opportunity that we haven't, you go to college. He said, but I will tell you this much. If we see you here next summer, we will beat the living tons of expletives out of you because you've been given a chance that we never were given. And, you know, I, I, I even say in the book, I said, you know, sometimes you just have to hear things in a way that they make sense to you. Yes. Yeah. And it, it could have been one thing if I'd have told my parents that same thing where they would have said, no, you need to stay in school. It's important to get. And as a 20 year old kid that goes in one ear and out the other. Yeah. OK. Yeah. School is important. Yeah. That's my parents saying that. But when you have these guys looking at you and one of them says, yeah, go ahead. You've been given this opportunity. If you F that up and you show up here again, we're going to lay into you. So I never saw them again after that summer. I did the right thing. I stayed in school. And, 
you know, I said, that's where I say, who knows though, what my journey would have been right. if I would have taken that path and gone back there and, you know, gotten the crap beaten out of me, but kept working there because at the time I was young, I was making $11 an hour working the graveyard shift. <laughs> and when you're working the graveyard shift, you sleep during the day. So you can't even spend that money. So in my mind, it's like, Hey, I'm making money. This is good. But you know, it's again, looking back at that, you tell that story to people, people laugh, they like that story, but it's like, no, that was a pivotal moment yeah. in my life where mm -hmm. somebody said something to me that I didn't expect to make the kind of sense that it made to me. Yeah. Um, and also to, to sort of knock me on the head and say, dude, you, this is a great opportunity for you. Not everybody gets that opportunity. Yeah. You know, so finish it off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was really just the, that was a very important uh, point in my life. Yeah. So, you know, as I'm reading your book and, and you, like we discussed earlier with the uh, experience with your mom and um, the other, you know, simple moment, like, it's crazy to me. You had like all of these, like you were, you had mindfulness, you had these spiritual experiences. You might not have had the context very much like myself. When I look back, I grew up in the punk rock, hardcore indie hip hop scene. And yeah, I look back now in my teenage years and that those were my first spiritual experiences. It was something greater than me. It was a community. It was like passion. It was, I was learning. I was on play. It was a beautiful thing. But you know, I look back and it's like, wow, you know, that was kind of my gateway in and you know here are all these experiences you're having too it's super cool and i Thank mentioned hip-hop something yeah. i learned about you i didn't know you were a uh -oh. pa on one of my all-time favorite <laughs> all-time favorite shows yeah there you go yo oh my god you've even got the cards i buy at least a, what i do is i buy usually a because <laughs> you can find them on ebay still I yeah. buy usually a box a year, and when people buy books directly from me, if they're not on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, I'll right. put a, a UMTV Raps card in, one of my stickers, <laughs> sign the book. I just want to give them fun stuff. Awesome. I read that, and I mean, you know, I love hip-hop is my, my thing. And, you know, I read yeah. you're 50 wearing a Wu-Tang shirt. I was wearing a Ghostface shirt the other day. And I'm, I'm a little <laughs> younger. I'm in my 40s, but it doesn't yeah. matter. So can, can you indulge me, aside from the Seinfeld, this is the only other sure, thing I'm sure, selfishly sure. asking – can you share any stories from working on that set? I mean, I can yeah. only begin to imagine, like, we I, had, I know you talk about, yeah, go ahead, please. When I, when I moved to LA, I, uh, that was the very first job that I had working for MTV was I had made a connection earlier, uh, at college with a guy from MTV. And then, uh, I got a call when I was in LA from Ted Demi. He had left the message and Ted Demi was the creator and producer, executive producer of Yellow. Yeah. And um, left a message, I come home, I was working the door to bar, come home, I had this message from Ted Demi saying, hey, we need a PA, we're coming to shoot in LA and wanna see if you want this gig. And I, I loved Yo! MTV Raps too at the time, so I was like, of course, are you kidding? So I sort of became their go-to guy when they'd come and shoot in LA. Um, and we shot at the LA river. I say river. It was, it's a concrete basin with no right. water in it. Uh, but we did a, a show down there with NWA and shot it down at the LA, which <laughs> in their like low rider 1965, I can't remember what it was, but it was like shooting there. I'm the only white guy in Ted <laughs> yeah. like there on the crew. And then there's like, gang members and stuff watching us film and they knew it was for yo mtv raps and um which was amazing but uh, the one story i'll share with you was we shot with ice cube when he had just left and he'd gone solo yeah and we were gonna film with him uh fourth of july a fourth of july episode with ice cube so they said here's the address you know meet us at the address this is where we're gonna shoot at his house so i said okay so i got there not even thinking, you know, I got my bag and everything I'm supposed to bring in there. Think that, okay, well, everybody's got to be here. So I ring the doorbell, the door opens, and Ice Cube's standing there. He's like, yo, what's up? And I was just like, uh, my name's Dan. I'm the PA. I'm here with you. Like, just crapping my pants. Because I'm not sure what to expect. Nobody was there yet. Because uh, we were shooting with Fab Five Freddy, and Ted yeah. wasn't there, and the camera crew wasn't there. And I've, I've talked to Cube a few times since then where NWA, Ice Cube, white guy showing up at his door. You're not sure what to expect. He's like, yo, come on in. 
going. He takes me back. There's a grill. You want anything to eat? Do you want anything to drink? Do you want just you want to chill by the pool? I don't. And it was like, you know, I guess because I had his CDs and the NWA right. CDs, like thinking, oh, my God, these guys, they're militant. They're this, this. And he's just, you know, he was in his house. He was just being a regular guy. Yeah. He's just, you know, NWA. No, this is just Ice Cube. This is just, you know, he's chilling at his house and his friends were there. He's introducing me to his friends. So that probably not even 10 minutes before Ted and everybody else got there was kind of an enlightening experience for me of just like the first time that I'm seeing celebrities and, and musicians and rappers where it's like, Hey, they're just like everybody else. I'm sitting here having a hot dog with ice cube before, yeah. before we even start to shoot. Yeah. And I'm hanging out. So then of course, then when Ted gets there, he's like, get up. What are you doing? Like, Let's go. You got to yeah. start to work. You're not here to just chill and eat. You got, it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I got to go to work. That's right. I got to make this money. <laughs> but, um, just really, that was a lot of fun. And the other thing that was, and I touch on it a little bit in the book. Uh, one of the things back in the '90s that was huge '80s and '90s. Yeah, it's when MTV was MTV. Yes. So any MTV swag you could get because you couldn't buy the stuff online. You couldn't go to Target and get it. If you got an MTV hat or a Yo MTV Raps T-shirt, you got it from somebody that worked at MTV. Right. So that was also when because you know Yo was produced out of New York. I lived in LA, but when I'm walking around LA and I had that hat. Or that shirt, people were like, where'd you get that? How'd you get that? <laughs> So the power of the MTV shirts and the Yo! MTV rap shirts uh, was pretty amazing back in the day. I love that. I've re- I think you, I remember you saying something like a whole book could be written about that. And you just left Completely. it and you're like, I'm out. <laughs> Completely. Because I've had friends that worked out of New York. Uh, the, the producer of my show, MTV Sports, Patrick Burns, yeah. would even say back in the day, he said, we would get first class we'd get bumped up to first class on flights yeah he said they would intentionally take wherever they'd go and shoot he said we would intentionally take an extra 10 hats and 10 shirts keep it in a carry-on bag and anything we needed goes and if it wouldn't get us bumped up it would get us free drinks it would get us. <laughs> he said so we would use that for any it was better than money so yeah that's super cool yeah i mean i only visited the studios once i saw a taping of uh tom green's show and you know so oh, we're yeah. going back yeah. yeah uh but even being in the studio was incredible i can only imagine like working there and and i did laugh though because you're working yet mtv sports was after that but you're you're not making enough like to to live at that point right uh-huh. like you're you were waitering no. or something like that was i that had right? um i when i got the job i was a pa at mtv yeah, uh, they had opened up a West Coast office, and I got hired then to be uh, sort of the in-house PA. So I was I had a full-time job then. That was great. Yeah. I was making 300, 300 bucks a week. But then when I ended up getting the MTV Sports job, um, that was four hundred dollars per show, and we were only yeah. doing twenty shows for the year. So I was actually making a hell of a lot less as on-air talent than I was as a PA. So, and I lived, I was living in a guy's uh, basement in, in Manhattan Beach at the time and renting that out. And, uh, but I had told Patrick Burns, the producer of the show, I'm like, look, we were the number one show. We were on in 72 countries and we were the number one show in Europe and worldwide for them. And I said, I'm going to have to take a job bartending. Like I can't pay rent. And um, is there anything you can do? And so he said, no, it's not in the budget. We can't give you a raise, but we can. He said he found in the budget that there was, they had room to hire one more production assessment, one more PA. Uh, He said, and so since the show itself was produced out of New York, I lived in LA. He said, we're going to hire you to become the the West Coast production assistant (laughs) for MTV Sports. So I became my own PA on the show that I worked on just to make the extra $300 a week. Yeah. But I, they legit made me work for it. It wasn't like they oh, just yeah. said, write this off. But it's like location scouting, booking flights, yeah. booking cars, you know, um, go, coming up with ideas. Go and find out what goes on at this event to see if we should right. shoot something there. So, yeah, it was – which was great for yeah. me too. It was like, all right, I'm going to get the money. i got to earn it. So, um, yeah, that was one of – even I did a um, – Instagram live with Bill Bellamy, oh, uh, my old friend from MTV, just okay. to do talk about rock and jock during the quarantine. Yeah. And I brought that story up to Bill and he's like, yo, because everybody else, I was the only piece of talent, myself and Pauly Shore in LA. Yeah. Everybody was getting paid except Dan. So he's like, oh man, I wish I would have known. I would have <laughs> sent you money. Like we were getting paid in New York. 
I go, yeah, I kind of got hosed there with the contract because I, they knew I was a PA. That I auditioned for that MTV Sports gig on a Monday, and I had the job by Friday. But right, um, shooting the pilot episode by Friday. But they had said you need to sign this contract and send it back, or we're hiring somebody else. And in the contract, it was like four hundred dollars per episode. So I was like, at that time, I didn't care about the right. money. It didn't really dawn on me. I'm like, I just want the on-air job. So yeah, uh, yeah. I laughed out loud at that. You were your own assistant because I'm like, you know, I often think I have a literary agent. I don't have anything aside from that. I don't have an assistant. I don't have a manager. I'm me. You know, I yeah. answer all my own emails. And there are times where I'm like, Chris, how can you hire yourself to do those other jobs? And then I read that. I'm like, sure, <laughs> all right, go work for MTV. That's how it gets done. Yeah, so, there you go. That's congrats. how they do it. <laughs> so I want to move on to the third part of your book. We got about 20 sure. minutes. If that you, that's still okay with your schedule. Sure. But, yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, this is. So everything, and I know we're skipping over a lot, which is good because it gives more incentive for everyone listening and watching this. Please go buy this book. Honestly, I don't have guests on if I don't really believe in what they're doing. So I'm vouching. This is a great book. And as I'm sure you can already tell, Dan's awesome. So third part of your book, Dan, is where you're talking about you're coming into parenthood at this point. And this is, you know, there's a lot of wisdom already up to this point. But this is where I think the bulk of like you're really like the the wonderful takeaways for readers um can be found so first off you become a dad and this part also struck me because your first son roman was born as an emergency c-section i my brother was also born he's two years younger as an emergency c-section i was born as a c-section not an emergency but at three months into the pregnancy they told my mom it was 1978 in maine uh or no 77 at that point rural town in maine that um, I wasn't going to be born. I was going to be a miscarriage. And oh. yeah, so I mean, here I am 42 years later. Um, yeah. but, you know, she had to go through that experience. So when I read that about you, your first child, emergency C-section, and then yeah. the way you write it, I got to see my son a few hours earlier. Like I was really yeah. touched by that. So, but that was your introduction to parenthood. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, he was, uh, he was born in, in an emergency C-section because his umbilical cord was too short. Right. So every time he would drop into the birth canal, he'd lose blood supply and oxygen. Yeah. So his heart rate would drop severely. So um, the emergency C-section took place. He was healthy. And then my ex-wife at the time went into, when they had C-sections at the time, he'd go into recovery for two hours. So I went with Roman to... Uh, they clean them off and all that yeah. with the nurses. So I wasn't really as my first child. I w- didn't know the protocol, what exactly took place. Sure. And he was a very calm, mellow baby. He cried when he was first born. You know, they put him under the little heat lamp. It looks like the little fries lamp at McDonald's. And then, um, and he's crying, crying. And I go, oh, it's okay. And his he's crying this way and just stops and looks and stop crying and just trying to focus because I was right there. Yeah. And didn't cry again. And the nurse kept saying, talk to him. He he understands or recognizes your voice. So when we went into, uh, I went with him, uh, with the nurses, they cleaned him up, wrapped, swaddled him. Nurse gave him to me and said, you can go sit in that office over there. He's a really good baby. Mm-hmm. You got about two hours to kill. And I was, and again, I was just like, so I just, so I just take him. I just go sit. <laughs> we sat in this little dark office and I sat in this chair with him facing me. And I would tell him to this day, and that's what I wrote about in the book, I would always say, hey, I programmed your computer at that point. I had two hours to kill, so I told you everything you needed to know about life. I was telling you at that point. But the realization that I came to in writing this book was, you know, actually it was my computer that was getting reprogrammed because I was on a, a new journey in my life. Yeah. So I didn't need to be telling him anything because him being there with me was telling me everything. Yeah. Um, so just to experience that and and to hold your child there, any of my children, the first time you hold them and they look at you and it's just, you know, it's again, it's a new journey. So that, um, you know, I think a lot of that feeling and intent comes across in that third part of the book. Oh, yeah, because it does. It changes you as an individual. Yeah, I've uh, I was married earlier on. I'm since divorced and engaged to an amazing woman. And I was very blessed with that experience of having a stepdaughter and I know it's not the exactly the same as being your own child, but I will tell you, I would have died yeah. for that little girl. Yeah. You know, it was uh, one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. And uh, so, yeah, it, I, I completely understand what you're saying and or as much as I can, but um, yeah. yeah, it, so yeah, this third part really, yeah, it, it, it deeply 
pulled me in the whole section and you go on and this is we're not going to get political here but it is apropos for the time so there's a, a yeah. chapter called the united colors of cortez absolutely yeah. love this you're talking <laughs> about first of all i didn't i forgot i didn't write this down but you were talking about where i believe your kids were going to school or, or one yeah. of them and and like you could see julia roberts in one moment and charlie sheen okay that on. was <laughs> that was and i tell people they went to kindergarten through eighth grade it was called yeah. a catholic school in malibu i live in malibu called our lady of malibu and right. anytime i tell people the name of that school they laugh and go no seriously what what was the name of the, and i'm like no that's the nobody ever believes that was the name of the school so i right. said yeah it's true i said it was and again, growing up in a very humble household outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, youngest of four, my dad was an Italian immigrant. Like, I, you know, I went to public school my entire life. So, you know, they go to this little Catholic school, and I said, it's the only place on earth you could see Julia Roberts talking with a teacher while Charlie Sheen simultaneously hits on them. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it was a pickup that day. Yeah. Um, this is where the chapter came from, uh, after school pickup. So, yeah, can you t talk a little sure. bit about it? Because, yeah, the story is I loved it. It was funny, but still like very meaningful, you know, like the way you handled it. Yeah, she, um, I picked up my both of my kids. My son was at fourth grade at the time. My daughter yeah. was in first grade. And so she came out of class and she had it's a pickup. Hey, guys, how'd it go today? What's going on? I was taking them to get some ice cream after school. And uh, long story short, she had asked. She said, hey, Dad, what color are we? And I said, what do you what do you mean? <laughs> What color? And I said, uh, why? Why are you asking? She said, well, Camille, there was a biracial girl in her class that said, told my daughter, India, she said, we're the only two black kids in the class. So my daughter was like, OK, well, I'm going to ask my dad. So I started laughing as we're driving. There. I said, what? You know, well, you know, what color do you think we are? And she goes, I think we're black. And I said, OK, why? I said, because it comes from your parents. Well, why do you think? I said, what color is your mom? And she said, orange. And so, and again, you know, it's the, the beauty of children where it's just right. total honesty. Of, Absolutely. And I said, okay, and what, and this was when President Obama was in office. I said, what, what color do you think I am? And she said, you're black. And I said, okay, you think I'm black? And, it, and I referenced it in the chapter two. I go, granted, I was a single father at the time. And I go, sure. I was very much into getting a tan and being single guy. <laughs> yeah. So I said, I was quite dark at the time. And, and my son in fourth grade, he goes, well, that, you know, you are, you are darker than President Obama. And I said, okay, then. So again, I, as I alluded to in the book, I said, you know, I thought maybe this is a good time as a parent to have, you know, a talk with them about not just a race talk, but like, hey, this is how you figure things out. And this is a perfect time for me to be Ward Cleaver. You know, right. let me try and do this. So, um, you know, it was one of those things where I just really felt I, I attempted to do something. And again, with kids, it's like, you know, it doesn't always turn out the way you want it to turn out. And the way that the whole chapter ends is I tell them, I said, well, you know, OK, if I'm black, we're orange. OK, we're tigers. And then try and put it. I said, look, it's a lot like ice cream. You know, I since we were going to get ice cream, I go, it right. doesn't matter what flavor you are. It all tastes good. Right. Yeah, yeah, and they're quiet. And right before my daughter, and she had a lisp with like her teeth, she, and she goes, "And we're chocolate," and gets out of the car. And I was like, I gave it a valiant effort. I was trying to, you know, make this analogy of it doesn't matter what color you are. And ice cream doesn't matter what flavor you are. Everybody's good. All the ice cream's good. She, she was like, "And we're chocolate." I was like, "Okay, we'll leave it at that for the day." But um, it worked though. Yeah, parenting 101, not so much, but uh, I give it a shot. No, I thought that was cute. I really love that. Like, I, I tried to put myself in that position. I'm like, I don't know how I would have handled that one. So, well, kudos. The funny thing is my, my daughter now is, is 16, and when I got my books uh, delivered to the house, yeah, she's flipping through just looking at the chapters and goes, what is this? <gasps> you did not put in the story <laughs> about us being tagged. I go, yes, I thought it was a great story. <laughs> yeah. It's a great it is a, is a parent. It's a good story. She's yeah. like, oh, no. You know, mortified as a 16-year-old. <laughs> so let's see. I got a couple more things. Um, I don't want to rush, but do want to get through this. The chapter, Waiting for My Real Life to Begin. Uh, again, third section. Just whew, You write in this, um, oh, you're at a Colin Hay concert. 
Side note, that song, Colin, I don't know if you know this one he did. Um, I don't think I'll ever get over you. It was on the Garden State soundtrack. Oh, yeah. my God. When I hear that song, like, I, yeah. I'm not too proud to say I tear up, man. He's, He's amazing. a beautiful musician. So, yeah. so you're at this concert, and that's cool enough, but you have this experience while you're there. It kind of, it's a longer story, but I want to share a part of what you wrote um, uh, based on the story. You write, there's a purpose to the pain. Uh, embrace that thought. Hell, go ahead and make out with it if you want. Just don't ever forget it. Trust me, the more you peel back the pain and embrace its purpose and why it exists, you'll not only heal, but you'll find strength and happiness buried deep inside that had been waiting for you. And, you know, there there was an escalator involved. And you, this was physical pain, but I feel like you're talking about pain, the human experience. I was. And um, sort of, again, long story short, there, the publisher's, were adamant about me writing about my divorce. Yeah. And and I didn't want to. I said it's not that book. Sure. And again, anybody that's been through a divorce, you've been through a divorce. Oh yeah. yeah. You you can devote a book to it. Of course. And I didn't just want to scratch the surface because just also knowing myself, I'd be like, well, if I say that, then I got to say this. If right. I say that, then I got And I didn't want the book to go off the rails. Right. So that chapter in effect and talking about there's a purpose to the pain was my way of expressing what I went through at that point in my yeah. life. And um, and there was, and there was, you know, there's a lot of pain that you go through, but the only way you can heal is to sort of look at the pain. And and when I first realized that, I went through therapy. Yeah. And I was never a therapy guy. I was always like, don't need it. I can figure stuff out myself. I can figure so well, I'm in I, therapy now, so I'll just yeah, I'll put that and, out and there. You know, <laughs> I'll tell you it's a it's an amazing thing. It is and yeah. um where I first sort of realized that was I was in therapy and I'm talking to my therapist and I'd been going for a while and I was explaining this situation, this yeah. event that took place with my ex-wife, this horrific, you know, there's a lot of really crazy things, but a horrific thing that happened. Yeah. And as I was telling him, I stopped and I just started to laugh and then I couldn't stop laughing. And he's like, what, what are you doing? And I said, I'm actually listening to what I'm telling you. And if I didn't go through it, I'd be laughing my ass off at this because this sounds like it's not real. It sounds like something out of a movie. Like right. this sounds so, and and then that laugh sort of turned into a different emotion where I start yeah. to well up. He said, and that's what he told me. He said, you're, it's because you're healing. You're, you're yeah. taking these experiences now that you went through and that you've experienced and now you're actually looking at it from a different perspective. I actually had a whole complete side note. I pitched a show that I wanted to do where I just talked to people about the worst experiences in their life, but the goal was to find the humor in it. Yeah, and that's a great idea. Through that. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, that's where that whole chapter came from, where it's like there's, you know, because then that helped me realize, like, wait, all this happened for a reason. There's a purpose yes. for all of this happening. Yeah. And it and it wasn't to just get me from point A to point B. It was getting me to open my eyes yeah. and and be aware and awake as to how I need to live my life. And if you can live your life this certain way and, and experience that pain and, you know, live in the moment. That's why I said a lot of times so many people say live in the moment, live in the moment. Yeah, that's great. So many people live in the moment when things are going really well. Right. But what when I tell people that I said the importance of living in the moment is to live in the moment when things are going to shit. Absolutely. And if you can absorb those times too and really learn from those moments and allow yourself to experience those moments, then you'll come out stronger on the other side of it. Yeah. So, yeah, man, there's a purpose to the pain. There is. Sure. It, it reminded me in, in the podcast we're doing right now is hosted on iconic you know spiritual teacher Ram Dass's network who yeah. passed away last year unfortunately but one of the great teachings I took away of the many from his work he has a quote where he says suffering is the sandpaper of our incarnation it does its job of shaping us and yeah. myself you know I'm in recovery from drugs and alcohol and I mean I've I've nearly died more than one time and reading wow. that really helped and you know and, and it just reading your chapter reminded like it wasn't all for nothing it could have been had I not use it as a catalyst to better myself yeah. and, and, and change. But thank goodness, you know, that I had that. And I, I love that you, you present that as well in your own way in the book. You know, and, and there's nothing wrong too, I think, cause I even had an issue with it too. There's nothing wrong with doing it. Yeah. 
there's nothing wrong with being proud of yourself, yeah. having come through something stronger on the other side. Because there was a lot of, especially the third section of this book, where I, again, struggled with it. I didn't want it to come across as, look at me. Right. But then it's also like, you know, you have to be proud of the struggle that you went through and how you've come through it. Right. Just like you're saying with drugs and alcohol, like you, be, you need to embrace that and be proud of yeah. that. Because yeah. it's like you said, it's helped to shape you into who you are uh, today and the man yeah. you are today. So, yeah. yeah for very sure. grateful for that. And thank you. Very well said. And so speaking of publishers, um, let's see, two things. I'm cutting some stuff out, but I don't want to yeah. lose these two. Um, towards the end, there's a chapter, how to, nope, how do I? completely resonated i'm going to share a brief excerpt from that because yeah. you're what you write basically i'm like holy shit dan and i are kind of the same in, in that <laughs> regard i loved it you're on yeah. a conference call with the publishers you express to them that um i don't know how to but i do know how i do and that works for me honestly i'm not the type of person who feels the need to tell anyone how to do anything but if you want to brainstorm and figure out something figure something out i'm your guy Amen. And then you go yeah. on to list like nine things. Um, I'll name a few just for listeners. Honesty, check yourself, positivity. I'm going to name them all. Uh, admit when you're wrong, live in the moment, learn from your mistakes, earmuffs, me first, and whose house? Fun house. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that. Is, is there any of those like one or two since we're a little you know short on time that you want to talk about yeah. or just in general? Um, I had... Uh... I had done a John Gordon I spoke of earlier. Yeah. Does it think power the positive summit where he has people come on and speak? And I took that chapter and actually molded it in to like seven and called it my reset seven for what people should do right now at this point in time with COVID and everything we're right. going through. So um, I just, you know, that was, again, I think I prefaced that by saying, here's things we all know, but sometimes it's good to remind yourself. And in writing this book, it was good for me because I reminded myself like here's certain things you can remind yourself to do. And, and I started with honesty just because, you know, it seems sounds simple and sure, just be honest. Yeah, of course. But the first person you have to be honest with and is yourself, but you've got to be 100%, you know, going through recovery, yeah. you have to be 100% honest with yourself. And I, I think I wrote this in the book because then it's 90, then it's 50, then you're off the rails. Then you're just yeah. saying stuff just to, yeah, okay, that sounds good to them, but you know, deep down inside, you're not being honest with yourself. So if you can start sort of with that core of being honest with yourself, yeah, everything else sort of falls into place. Because then I think the second one is I, I call it check yourself, where it's right. you being honest with yourself. Then when you find yourself in conflicts, what I've learned to do is like, I before I um, you know get back to any or if there is a conflict going on, I check myself first. Hey, am I yeah. the one that caused this? Yeah. Did I do something that maybe started this? And if, again, you can be honest with yourself in doing that, and if you can try and figure it out, did I have anything to do with it? If I did or if I didn't, then you've got a point to now, let's try and resolve this. Yeah. Here's what I did or here's what I didn't do. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, and that's a lot easier said than done, especially <laughs> if you're dealing with people that don't see things the way yes, that sir. you do. So, you know, admit when you're wrong, learn from your mistakes. You know, there's uh, admitting when I'm wrong has really come into play with me as a parent. I Absolutely. mean, and I yeah, find sure. that, you know, because then there's, you know, accountability from the top down. If dad yeah. is admitting when he screws up, OK, then we know it's an even playing field in the house. And that's really yeah. helped me as a parent. It helps with just, you know, in the workplace, too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the earmuffs, I say earmuffs was basically, look. Sometimes you're better off not saying anything at all because that'll yeah. speak volumes. Um, I think there's a point in there too where I talk about people always say, pick your battles. It's like, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> Rather than picking a battle, why not have a battle at all? Because a lot of times battles come from unnecessary confrontations, but a lot of times battles lead to wars that don't need to be happening. So, That's so true. Um, yeah, that was that element because uh, the reason I said how I do, they kept saying, write it as a how to book. Right. How-to book, and I'm like, no, right. I'm yeah. not writing it as a how-to book. Right. I know how I do things. Yes, I don't want to tell people you need to do it the same way I do, but right. I have no problem saying, here's how I do it. Yeah, like let's talk about it. Maybe it works for you. Maybe it doesn't. That's and that's what resonated. Like in my books, my teaching, my workshops, it's always I always preface everything. What I'm sharing 
in no way is do I believe it's a definitive truth. It's based on direct personal experience. My hope is that it will help you possibly avoid some of the pitfalls I've gone through. Maybe right. not, but you know, let's let's see what we can do here. And that's what I loved about that approach. I, I feel you really can engage more people that way than saying this is yeah. how you do it. You know, so yeah, I love that. Yeah, exactly. And so the final chapter um, is what was it? The fifty point jump shot. And you know, I read that. What what a feeling of hope you're providing in that. You know, obviously it's the final chapter. You're kind of bringing things together, and you know, you're talking about. To me, it was kind of like. I've went on this journey with you and you know, you're kind of summarizing in a way and talking about the great lessons of your life. And I think you listed, and I didn't know them. I know there's another list there. I think it was like 10 things maybe of lessons right. that you've taken away. I would love for you to anywhere you want to go with that, about that chapter, the lessons, um, whatever you want to do. The, um, the reason I call it that 50 point jump shot was, yeah. uh, the, when I worked at MTV, we played a lot of these rock and jock, yeah, celebrity, I remember. Yeah. Uh, softball and celebrity basketball games where they'd have, and that's from the celebrity basketball game where you'd have NBA players playing with rock stars, playing with actors, and they were so much fun. And one of the things they had that they came up with in that game was the last two minutes of the game, yes. of the half in the game, then a 50 point basket that was like 25 feet up in the air yeah. would come down. And if you made it, you could. So that was to appease a lot of MTV fans. But also, sure. I thought, you know, it's true with life too because it, it's just proof that you're never out of the game so yeah. i wanted to use that and just say look no matter how bad times may seem or how bad you may be feeling or whatever it only takes one thing to happen to put you right back in the game and you know that might sound i don't want to say ignorant but some people might go yeah but things could be pretty bad and you get but it's all on how you perceive yourself and how yeah. you perceive life yeah. And it's true. One thing needs to happen to get you right back in that game. That's why I said you drop that one shot. It can happen. So yeah. I wanted to end the book just as you said on a note of of hope. And yeah. I did. I, I listed some things in there too, where you know, again, to give people hope. And again, not again. It's how I do. I'm not telling you how to do things. Right. So um, you know, and they're just simple things like. Look, I like to tell people, They people always say, there's always tomorrow. I said, that's not necessarily always true. But there always is right now. And again, getting back to living in the moment. So enjoy and embrace right now. Yeah. Um, as opposed to don't wait for tomorrow. Why? Yeah. What's the point of waiting for tomorrow? And, you know, I always tell people too, a lot of people say, hey, you know, I don't want to start learning how to do something because that'll take so long. I'm going to learn a new language. I want to learn that. But yeah, you know how old I'll be? By the yeah. time I learn how to play the piano, and I always say, yes, yeah, same age you'll be anyway. Right. So why not be that age and be enlightened or learn how to play the piano or right. learn a new language? So it's just, you know, I I think what I've learned through my journey in life, too, and getting back to that final chapter, it's how you look at life, how you look at yourself. And, and one of the things I say in there, too, is like my goal at the end of every day is simple. It's just to wake up tomorrow and be a better man than I was today. Yeah. So do the best you can do today. And you know what? Tomorrow, I just need to be a little bit better than I was today. And, you know, simple things as far as just be kind, be good to people, yeah. be nice to people. As silly as that sounds, as simple as that sounds, hey, man, that, that can make the world such a better place. And that's the thing. The little things we can do for sure. Like it does. It makes a big difference. And you never know. Something I tell people how far that ripple effect will carry. You hold the yeah. door for someone. You pay for a toll of someone yeah. behind you. Buy them a coffee. The person line. Maybe they're having a yeah. bad day. And who knows how far that act of generosity or kindness will go. It, so it doesn't true. matter like if that you know or not. It's just, you know, at least you're putting it out into the world. So, yeah, Dan, yeah. I can't thank you enough. Like this book truly Thanks so much dude, it's awesome it, again it's step off my journey from mimbo to manhood hey, if, wait, uh, here it. it is hey there step off so yeah, that's right. <laughs> step off what <laughs> yeah so yes if you're checking this out on the uh, indie spirituals website scroll down we'll have that book linked if you're on the be here now network awesome. scroll down we're going to have that book linked there as well um dan again thank you for writing a really great book i hope listener uh, no i i know listeners now and viewers know it's not what they think it was and that's so cool man Excellent. i well, appreciate it chris thank you so much for the time thank you yeah i really appreciate it be well dan you too
I grew up on the crime side, the New York Times side. Staying alive was no job, had second hands. Moms bounced on old men, so then we moved to Shallon Land. A young youth, you're rocking the go-to. Low goose, only way I begin the G York was drug loot.